Hi, this is Josh with Resort TV One, and today I'm excited to bring you the second edition of my Thursday Thoughts video series. And this is a new video series where I give you my thoughts on Disney news or other current event topics around Walt Disney World and Disneyland. So, be sure to leave me a comment and let me know what you think about this video format as well as about the topics that I discuss on this particular edition of Thursday Thoughts. Also, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell if you haven't already done so, so that you get notified every time we go live or have a new video. And also, of course, be sure to follow us on social media. We're Resort TV One on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And finally, don't forget to give this video a like because it really does help. When you give the video a like, YouTube recommends the video to more people. With that being said, I'd also like to encourage you to leave a comment for next week's video and let me know what topics that you'd like to discuss. So if there's current Disney news or other uh, you know, topics of discussion that have been debated around the blogosphere, or around some of the forums, something that you'd like to discuss about Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or anything else uh, in the theme park realm of uh, events, be sure to leave that as a comment down below. I'll read those comments and I will try and include as many of those as possible in next week's video. So leave those comments. Let me know what you'd like to discuss next week. I really appreciate your help with that. And of course, I'd like to see your comments on all of the Disney news that we discuss, and we can have a discussion as far as uh, you know your opinion, whether you agree with me or not. It's totally okay to disagree. We all have different opinions about things, and I was really interested last week to read so many great opinions about the topics that we discussed, and some of them weren't the same as mine, but that is great. That's what makes it interesting. If we all agreed on everything, then things would be pretty boring, right? So uh, that's one thing that I look forward to for this video is those comments just to see what you guys think. I also wanted to say that I had a couple really great comments from people about using some B-roll and graphics in this video as well to make it a little bit more interesting and a little bit more professional. And I agree with that, and I will try and use a few of those as we go along today, but uh, it has been a long week, and I don't have a whole lot of time to edit tonight, so we will see how many things I get in here. But uh, I will try some B-roll and some graphics and see how that works out for this time. So, hope you enjoy the video. Let's get started. And the first topic I want to talk about this time is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And this, of course, has been something that's been a hot topic for a while since it opened at Disneyland uh, in early June, late May. So uh, we definitely are interested in your thoughts on this. But the biggest topic that has been discussed is, is Star Wars Galaxy's Edge successful? And so that's a really big question. Of course, that depends on a number of different factors. Um, and I think that overall, I think Galaxy's Edge has been successful, though not in the way Disney originally intended. I think they were really hoping for the blockbuster crowds and things like that, and that never really materialized at Disneyland. Now, at Disney World, opening day was crazy, and you saw the live stream we did and everybody waiting out front and, uh, you know, to try and be the first ones in and all that. And so that was a lot of fun for us to be up and around at 3 a.m. in the parks and things like that. But... Uh, after that, the crowds did trail off after that initial hype of excitement when the park opened or when the land opened, I should say. So I think it was a success, but again, Disney was really expecting those crowds to continue. However, they did the Disneyland opening just a little bit differently than I think that they would have uh, or should have done, really. Um, you know, Walt Disney World, they just opened the floodgates and let everybody in. Whereas at Disneyland, they did the reservations, which made it really great for those of us that were there because it wasn't crowded. We got to enjoy the land and, you know, ride the uh, Smuggler's Run several times, and it was really great for us. But I think that it uh, caused people not to go to the parks during the summer if they didn't have those reservations. Then I think it kind of killed the initial excitement of the opening. So I'm wondering if you agree with me on that. But I do feel like the reservations were good for crowd control, but definitely bad for the excitement and the momentum of a land opening, especially a land that's been hyped so much as Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. So I think those things definitely uh, tempered the excitement and tempered the crowd levels just a little bit at the very beginning. As far as is it successful, I think it is. I think it's a beautiful land. Um, I think that there are a lot of things done really, really well. But, you know, I do think, and we talked about some of the issues with it, it only has one attraction right now. Then that will be changing with Rise of the Resistance when that opens. So definitely, uh, I can't wait to see Rise of the Resistance. And we'll talk about that here in just a second. But, you know, also, I think that uh, a lot of the other things to do in the land besides Smuggler's Run are, uh, you know, things that you have to pay to do, like the uh, Savi's lightsaber workshop, the droid, uh, you know, build a droid a depot and all that kind of thing. Uh, those experiences you do have to pay for. So that does turn people off a little bit when they've already paid a significant amount to get into the land. 
We have not done the lightsaber experience uh, just because of the cost, and we know we probably wouldn't use the lightsaber later or probably would just display it somewhere maybe. So we haven't done that. Uh, we may one of these days just one time to get the experience. But the Build-A-Droid was really neat to watch Jenna do on the stream. So uh, I will say that that was a lot of fun, and it looked like a great experience. Uh, whether it was worth $100 or not probably depends on uh, how big of a Star Wars fan you are. But uh, that's, I think, one of the biggest complaints is that a lot of the you know other experiences besides the ride right now are actually an upcharge. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing about whether it's successful or not is, you know, Galaxy's Edge was a lot different than a lot of people had originally thought it was going to be. I think a lot of people, when they said, oh, Disney's going to build Star Wars Land, you know, at that point, I don't think it had even been called Galaxy's Edge yet. They'd announced it at D23 a few years ago. And, you know, people were very excited. And I think what people thought they were going to get was a land that we'd seen before in the movies and things like that, uh, similar to how Universal did. Uh, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, I think that people thought Disney was going to build a familiar land like a Tatooine or even, you know, an indoor or something like maybe a combination of lands, you know, whatever the case may have been. And certainly Disney could have done that, and I'm sure they would have done an amazing job with it. However, uh, you know, Disney had the idea and the Imagineers had the idea, which was a great idea, that, uh, you know, none of us were part of those stories in Tatooine and Endor and anywhere else. Of course, they couldn't do Hoth in Florida. Uh, that really doesn't work as well. You know, kind of Blizzard Beach and Star Wars Land, I don't think would, would work. So, but, uh, but anyway, uh, Disney said we weren't part of those stories in those movies. And so they wanted to create a whole new place that had never been featured in any of the movies or any of the spinoffs, books, or anything in the Star Wars universe. Uh, really something completely new, but kind of give it a backstory that went with part of the new trilogy. And so that was a pretty bold choice, I thought, by Disney. First of all, I appreciated the idea and the storytelling involved in it. But also, I think that it was probably just a little bit difficult for people to grasp at some point that concept because people were really, you know, wanting to see Darth Vader. They were wanting to see Tatooine. They were wanting to see, you know, the cantina, the place where uh, Obi-Wan and Luke were first uh, kind of accosted by the stormtroopers, you know, at the gate to Mos Eisley and all those things. They were really wanting to see some of those things. Now, granted, that would have been difficult to build. But if you look at the Wizarding World of Harry Potter, you know, they really did build two very recognizable lands. Uh, in the Harry Potter series. You know, they built Hogsmeade over in Islands of Adventure with Hogwarts Castle, which is, of course, a huge icon. And they also built, you know, Diagon Alley, which is another really famous, famous place in the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. And so I think people really identified with that. Of course, you don't really see the characters walking around because obviously they're all, you know, regular people kind of face characters. So you do see wizards and they walk around, they have, you know, different uh, backstories and, you know, they interact with you as a muggle and things like that. And Disney did try to do that with Galaxy's Edge with the cast members all having backstories and Batu and things like that. So uh, I'm curious what you think. If you've been to Galaxy's Edge, leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about the cast member interactions so far. We've had some really good ones where the cast members really knew their backstory, were really into it. Um, on one of the live streams we did on opening day, the cast member in the cantina was just really, really upset when we brought in the Coke bottles, which were supposed to be thermal detonators. And she kept saying, get that out of here. Don't bring that into my bar, you know, my cantina, whatever it was. And she was really playing the part quite well. We were able to kind of play around with her on it and kind of antagonize her a bit with it. So she really had a good grasp on the acting of it. Now, not all cast members, of course, are that gifted of an actor. I don't know how well I would do with it or maybe didn't remember their backstory. So let me know how effective you think that was using the cast members as basically citizens of Batman. Too. So I think, again, just all those things I just mentioned were why Galaxy's Edge was different than people originally thought it was going to be. So, uh, you know, I think it would have been cool to see them create lands that have already been done and maybe even in the in the earlier trilogy that people seem to identify with that original trilogy, the fourth movie, fifth and sixth movies there that, that really were the original Star Wars series. Um, I think people do identify with that a little bit more. Uh, another thought that I had, though, if they wanted to still do Galaxy's Edge and make it a new land, I think that's great. I think it maybe fits in the park better because it's hard to construct some of these, you know, grandiose places in the Star Wars universe a little bit more than it would be Harry Potter. I think that what they could have done is maybe not been quite so strict with the, the rules of the Star Wars universe uh, because they were trying to stick to a certain time period, I believe. It was between um, the eighth movie and the ninth movie, kind of where we are in the trilogy, in the last trilogy right now. 
Um, so I think that is where they were kind of headed. The problem is once the, you know, once the last movie comes out here, you know, in, in, a, in a couple months, I think that, uh, it will end up, you know, being a little bit lost in a vacuum of time. So maybe they don't have to be super strict with the timeline. I know Universal hasn't been super strict with the Harry Potter timeline. So uh, if they would relax that a little bit and kind of just let things open up and allow some of the other characters to be part of the story. I know Chewbacca's there. I know R2-D2 is there. Uh, and Ray and, and, you know, of course, uh, BB-8 is kind of featured in there in some places. So certainly uh, those characters are there and the droids are easy to kind of put in and out of the story. Uh, and Kylo Ren, of course, and the Stormtroopers are an ever-present part of the Star Wars universe. But I think if they opened it up a little bit more and just added uh, some other characters, you know, maybe set, found a way to put Yoda in, uh, maybe found a way to, even if it was the spirit of Yoda, you know, whatever you want to say, through the Force. Uh, there's a lot of things that they could do, I think, to appeal to the fans of the original trilogy. And in Disney's very creative. I'm sure they'll come up with something. But leave me your ideas for how you think Disney could appeal to the hardcore Star Wars fans a little bit more with Galaxy's Edge. I think there are things they could do without changing, you know, the land and, and uh, the scenery itself. So let me know what you think. Um, and also, you know, I think another thing that really has contributed to Galaxy's Edge being maybe not as successful as they thought is that there were budget cuts along the way. They had a lot of uh, really cool ideas for how the land was going to operate with, uh, you know, the, some of the RFID technology and the long-range RFID readers. They were going to be able somehow... Uh, through that long-range technology and the magic bands, or even maybe the data pad, the play app, they were going to allow you to be basically part of the story more than even you are before. For instance, if you did really poorly in Smuggler's Run, they were going to have bounty hunters and different uh, citizens of Batu coming after you and letting them know you're letting you know that you know you owe them a certain amount of credits for damaging the ship, and you know Chewie's mad, he's coming after you, and maybe Chewie even when he does uh, come after you, maybe he. Um, you know, actually uh, shows some some anger about you crashing the ship a little bit. You know, whatever it is, they were talking about doing some things like that. Or if you really did well, you would have been kind of a hero and celebrated. Maybe they would have come up to you and said, boy, I heard you're one of the best star pilots in the galaxy. Things like that. I think that would have made it way more immersive and made you feel like uh, part of the action even more so than, than, you know, you were before. And that, that part seems to have been cut out of the budget. So that could be brought later. And I hope maybe Disney will reconsider that element. I think that would have made it much more immersive. Uh, another thing that was cut was there were supposed to be droids kind of rolling around throughout the land. So that's something uh, that was cut as well. If you look at some of the earlier concept art, and we'll try and show some of that right here, you can see droids uh, rolling around and kind of interacting with people. I think that would make the land feel much, much more alive. So I really do hope Disney can add in some droid interactive experiences, whether it be just as part of roaming actors, kind of like what Vi the Spy and kind of like, uh, you know, Chewbacca, Ray, and, and the Stormtroopers, as well as uh, Kylo Ren, maybe add some droids in there as well. And so they could have, uh, you know, citizens of Batu, some cast members walk around with the droids and be part of that action. But I think it would be really cool to include the droids and just make everything more moving, more alive, more technology, uh, make you really feel like you're in the Star Wars universe. Because in the universe, uh, you know, in the movies, when they're in these busy spaceports, you see droids everywhere kind of rolling around and they're just kind of part of the crowd. So um, I really do hope they add that in as well. Leave a comment and let me know uh, what you think about that. And one more thing. I think, uh, you know, we want to talk about is the rise of the resistance. Of course, that's coming up here in the beginning of December, as long as everything goes well. It's slated to be one of the biggest rides and one of the biggest things Disney's ever done. So will that save Galaxy's Edge? Uh, I hope so. I really do. I, I love Galaxy's Edge the way it is, but I really want it to be more popular and I want it to appeal to a wider audience. Uh, Rise of the Resistance is supposed to be just state-of-the-art, incredible technology, everything larger than life. You know, so I can't wait to see what Disney has done with it. And uh, hopefully that will really get people excited about Galaxy's Edge. So only time will tell, but all of the things and leaks that I've seen about it are indicating that it is going to be an incredible experience. So let me know what you think about Rise of the Resistance. So another thing we talked about, you know, we talked about what Disney could do to make Galaxy's Edge better. We talked about adding more droids, make it more alive, uh, you know, things like that. We also talked about, um, you know, the budget cuts. So the budget cuts actually made it so that instead of a huge restaurant, which was originally planned for Galaxy's Edge, only the cantina survived. Originally in the plans, from what I've heard, um, the cantina was just supposed to be an entry lounge to the huge restaurant behind it. And so I don't know if there's still room for that restaurant 
in Galaxy's Edge or if they completely wrote it out of the plans. I haven't really looked at the satellite views or the maps. But uh, if they can somehow build that restaurant, just like they're adding uh, the restaurant to Toy Story Land, if they could somehow build that restaurant and either attach it to the cantina or even not, I think that would really help to get a real full themed restaurant, uh, more of a sit-down experience, maybe with some entertainment, some shows, maybe a live cantina band with kind of exotic, you know, Star Wars type space instruments. That would be incredible. And I think that would go a long way towards the immersiveness of the land. And that would be something too, you know, even if it's a sit-down dinner and it's more expensive than counter service, it would allow another entertainment experience to be accessible to more guests. So let me know what you think about that idea. Um, you know, I think anything's possible. I think they can always add on a restaurant. Disney's really good at, at, at squeezing things in different places. So I would love to see that besides just the cantina experience. The other thing is there was supposed to be a third ride from what I had kind of heard, like a roller coaster type thing, uh, kind of like you were riding one of the flying creatures. I, the name escapes me right now, but, uh, I think it would be pretty incredible to uh, have some type, maybe not a roller coaster, but just a different attraction. The idea was the ride was going to kind of circle the land a little bit and go in throughout uh, Batu in different places. Now, maybe they thought that would mess with the theming too much, but I do think that they can look into maybe planning a third ride, even if it was uh, something a little bit more simple. Obviously, it wouldn't. They wouldn't have room for anything epic like Rise of the Resistance. But I really do think that there need to be. Uh, there needs to be at least one more ride in the land somewhere. And no, not a spinner. Okay, you know we don't need like uh, space. Uh, you know spaceship spinners or anything like that. You know we have the Astro Orbiter in Tomorrowland already. But uh, there are some things they can do, and I think Disney is creative enough to, uh, you know, to uh, add something else to the land. So. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, just opening up the concept, maybe not being so strict with the timeline a little bit. Maybe some Star Wars purists might not be super happy about that, but I think the idea is to make it appeal to a wider audience. So maybe not being just so strict with the timeline. So that's really all I have about Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. I know that was a pretty lengthy discussion, but again, take the time right now. You can pause the video, leave me a comment. Let me know if you agree with what I said, or if you're like, no, I don't agree with any of that, or just let me know. I'm interested to read it. And another thing I want to talk about in this video is the addition of intellectual property or what we call IP to the parks. This was actually requested in one of the comments that I got on the video, um, the first Thursday Thoughts video. And so I wanted to talk about this a little bit. This has been a hot topic around Disney enthusiasts for a long time as the introduction of more intellectual property characters and things to the parks, especially Epcot has really gotten a lot more intellectual property. Uh, when Epcot first opened, um, you know, they did have characters and they were kind of themed to, you know, space suit. I always love space Mickey and space Minnie and, and all the other characters. That was great. Uh, I don't think anybody minded that at all. It kept with the theming and it you know, still allowed the characters to be in the parks, but adding the characters, um, you know, to the rides and to some of the shows, I think has rubbed some people the wrong way because Epcot was really all about original attractions and experiences along with the, the in future world and along with the uh, original cultural experiences in world showcase. World Showcase still retains most of those, uh, you know, original cultural experiences. Of course, they've added Frozen and now Donald Duck, or, you know, well, Donald Duck and then Frozen, I guess, to World Showcase. And they're looking now, to, of course, they're adding Ratatouille and then Mary Poppins uh, to the different, to the France Pavilion at the UK Pavilion. So they are adding more uh, IP to World Showcase. I think it's, actually, I think this part is good. It kind of hurts me to say it a little bit, but I, I think adding the, the IP to World Showcase is not necessarily a bad thing. Obviously, I miss Maelstrom. It was an amazing ride. So, uh, you know, I have said before, I think Frozen's a well-done ride, and they could have maybe uh, somehow kept Maelstrom and gotten Frozen in there. I don't know. Probably not realistic. But I, I don't have a problem with them adding um, Ratatouille and adding Mary Poppins. I've said they need rides on that side of the park for a long time. They could have done original rides. Uh, you know, they could have done... Uh, you know, a riverboat cruise, um, you know, somewhere in Paris along uh, along the river there and, you know, next to uh, the Notre Dame Cathedral as well as, uh, you know, around uh, in that area, uh, you know, of Paris that's so famous. They could have done that or they could have uh, very easily, you know, in, in Great Britain could have done, um, you know, any other type of a ride around the English countryside and things like that. But I think putting the intellectual property in there really does draw more families in, especially kids, get them more interested maybe in exploring the culture of the country. So I'm okay with that. My thing right now is though, um, you know, in future world, I have a little bit more of an issue with it, adding Guardians of the Galaxy to Universe of Energy. I just don't know that it fits super well. I would have rather seen the Guardians of the Galaxy be uh, either in uh, somehow maybe in Magic Kingdom, um, you know, somewhere uh, in Tomorrowland would have been great. Or 
you know, maybe somewhere in uh, Hollywood Studios. I know there's not really any room to, to do that, but I think it would have fit better there with the movie theming and things like that and still kept Epcot, uh, you know, Universe of Energy. Even if they did it as some type of a thrill ride, maybe make it uh, either an original character or just make it still a little bit more educational. Again, I know they're trying to draw in the crowd, so I understand it's a double-edged sword. Uh, you know, they're trying to keep those uh, profits high and keep the people coming. So I do get that, and I understand that has to happen when you're running a business. But uh, I know, you know, Universe of Energy, by bothers me a little bit, you know, looking at maybe Moana coming in at some point uh, in, you know, in some of the announcements we've seen, stuff like that. I'm just not sure if it needs to completely invade. I'd really like to see Disney come up with at least one new original character for Epcot. I think there's room for it in a pavilion somewhere. You know, Figment has been hugely successful and they've continued to use him ever since uh, Imagination or Journey into Imagination opened in 1983. But, uh, I think they should take a risk, and I think that they should create a new original character. Now, they could still do TV shows, movies, whatever kind of synergy opportunities they want to do. They could go ahead and do that with that new character, but I think it would be cool if the character started in the parks first and then moved into the uh, TV and movie realm. So leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about that. I think it's time to take a risk. Of course, they're being safe with some of the other IP, but um, you, you maybe do a little bit of both. And that way, you know, Walt always used to say he had so many different movies lined up. Uh, one of the interviews I watched of him, you know, he had all these movies lined up so that if one didn't hit, the next one would. So I feel like Disney can do the same thing with the parks. You know, if they have some IP, okay, they know people are going to really enjoy seeing Ratatouille. They know people are going to enjoy Moana if she comes in, and Guardians of the Galaxy is going to be fun. So maybe... You know, step outside the comfort zone a little bit for one ride and say, okay, let's create something new. And maybe there'll be other opportunities. People will fall in love with this character. If the character is good enough, if the music, the story, everything is good enough, they might fall in love with it. So uh, let me know what you think. Along with that, too, I've been talking about, you know, all the remakes and things like that of the movies, uh, the live action remakes like The Lion King, uh, Aladdin, thing, uh, movies like keep saying things like that. Sorry, but all those different uh, remakes that they've been doing, I think those are really cool to see. But I also, again, I'm looking for more original content. So I hope that Disney in the future, again, takes a few more risks. The risks are really what, you know, make Disney great and what have made Disney great in the past. If it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I understand there's a lot of money involved and they have to please the shareholders and everything like that. But uh, in order to be great, you have to take risks. So I hope that they'll take some risks on some original and new characters for movies and TV and some new characters for the parks. Let's see some new stories, uh, you know, and let's just see some new concepts. There's a lot of things that haven't been explored. You know, it could be even borrowing from a fairy tale. Maybe that hasn't been explored yet. There's so many fairy tales out there. I'm sure they can find and adapt one and create lovable characters based off of those things, or maybe just an original story. Um, so, you know, leave me a comment again. Let me know uh, what you think about that. And uh, here's a question for you, a little bit of trivia. Um, what was the last non-IP, non-intellectual property built at Walt Disney World? Or attraction, I should say. So what was the last non-intellectual property attraction built at Walt Disney World? Let me know what you think in the comments. I have an idea of what I think it is, but I'm not going to give it away. So uh, I think it's been quite a while. So what was the last attraction built at Walt Disney World that did not feature any intellectual property at all? No characters, uh, nothing like that that had ever been done before. So let me know what you think about that. Um, and I just have one more point here. Um, you know, intellectual property is good when it's used effectively, but the parks also need to be able to stand on their own. So that's kind of my last point, and I'll leave you with that, about the intellectual property discussion. It's a hot topic. Everybody's got opinions. Uh, I'm not completely against it. I understand why it happens. I understand why it needs to happen. And intellectual property has been used since the parks you know, open. They've used different uh, movies and TV shows and things, and I think it makes it relatable to guests, but uh, I do think that they need to be careful and it needs to be done well every single time. So, And the last topic I want to discuss, and this is a short one, is musicians at Walt Disney World. I talked about live entertainment last time in Barutica, the African band, which just unfortunately had their last performance uh, there at Animal Kingdom, was part of that musician group. But uh, music at Walt Disney World, we need more music and I'm talking live music, not less. And I know it's expensive. I know the musicians, you know, there's there's unions and there's contracts and all those things that I'm not privy to. 
but music is what makes Walt Disney World magical. And that's me as a music major. I'm a, you know, I'm a band director. I'm a musician. So of course I'm going to go for music, but you take music out of the parks and it's not magical anymore. It's just that simple. And, uh, you know, if you don't believe me, walk around one of the parks when the area music's off, it completely changes the feel of it. Yeah. It's a little bit peaceful, but also when you're used to hearing a certain song in a certain area of the park, it makes you feel really weird not to hear it. So the music really makes the parks magical. Can you imagine happily ever after with no soundtrack? I mean, it would be beautiful fireworks, but the storytelling wouldn't be there. Even if they kept the narration and it'd be like, oh, that's nice narration. That's a nice narrator. But you take the movie out of the equation or take the music out of the equation and that magic, that love, that, you know, emotion is gone. So the music is the magic. So getting back to live entertainment, I kind of went on a tangent there. Getting back to live entertainment, um, and live music, you know, this is part of what inspired me to be a band director, to be a musician, is, you know, the music that I heard at Disney when I was growing up, it was incredible, it blew my mind, you know, at Epcot, we have Future Core, uh, you know, now we have the Jammeters, uh, we had, uh, you know, the, the uh, Future World Brass, all those kind of uh, different groups, they had a Magic Kingdom, uh, Tomorrowland Brass at one point, uh, you know, they still got the Main Street uh, Philharmonic, the band that marches down the street, both at Disneyland and at Walt Disney World, Um, but you know, I think they could still use more and, uh, you know, the jazz band, one of the things, my favorite things to do uh, at Disneyland is to go see the jazz band or the swing band there in the Royal Palace theater, right next to the, uh, Sleeping Beauty castle. It's one of the most magical experiences I ever had at a Disney park. And it was at Disneyland. Uh, the first time, uh, Steph and I, my wife went to, uh, Disneyland, we were wandering around the parks, really enjoying it. I hadn't been there for years and years, and she hadn't been there ever. And so we were really just discovering it for the first time together, which was amazing. And we got, uh, we kind of heard the music and we got over towards the theater. We started heading over there. And, you know, usually, you know, she doesn't want to stay and listen to the live performances quite as much as I do. She'll listen to a few songs and, okay, you know, it's time to go. But uh, it was such a beautiful night that night. And the music they were playing was just so incredible. It was a magical experience. Um, It's something I'll never forget. And just, you know, being there, the atmosphere, being at Disneyland, the weather being perfect, everything just lined up. And it was just incredible. It was something I'll never forget about my visit to Disneyland. And even if I wasn't such a huge fan, that alone would make me want to come back. Just that experience. I want to recreate that feeling. You know, and I go watch the, the swing band every single time I'm there just to you know, relive that happy memory. So I do think um, that it is really, really important that they continue to have these live bands in the parks. And, of course, they've got the Grand Floridian Society Jazz Orchestra at Walt Disney World. And that's really, really cool. It's an amazing group of people. They're great performers. Um, But I think they need something like that in the Magic Kingdom. I really, really do. Uh, Of course, they could put it at Epcot, at the America America Gardens Theater. And they do have a lot of great bands at the America Gardens Theater. So definitely not knocking that at all. But I think they're in the Magic Kingdom, in the middle of the Magic. It would be so cool. I know that the, the layout is so different, so there's not really room for a theater uh, there close to the castle, maybe like there is at Disneyland, just because the moat is so much bigger at Walt Disney World and some of the uh, walkways are so much wider as well. But if they could put that anywhere in the Magic Kingdom, even you know, maybe in Tomorrowland, uh, you know, wherever they can find a place, to put a jazz band somewhere, to put you know some more live, even if it's not a jazz band, more live music, Uh, There, I think, especially in the evening when it's a beautiful night, it really makes it magical for people, even if they don't stay and watch, but just a couple songs. So that's something I'd really like to see. Uh, Leave me a comment and let me know uh, what you think. And, you know, also another thing that uh, I noticed when I was at Disneyland is just the Disneyland band was so incredible. Of course, the Main Street Philharmonic at Walt Disney World is, is, is amazing, too. But the Disneyland band, they were really like a marching band in the middle of Main Street. I mean, yes, of course, both bands march up and down the street. But the Disneyland band was doing like formations and almost drum corps, drum corps style marching. They had some incredible arrangements of the different songs. So really, it was a little bit... Uh, even of a higher level of the than the one at uh, Walt Disney World. So I hope that uh, Disney World can step up their game just a little bit more on that uh, and just maybe revitalize some of their uh, band performances in that way. So um, that's really all I had to say about the uh, live entertainment and music concept and topics. So just make sure, again, you leave me your comments and let me know what you think about all of these different things. 
And so that's all I have to discuss for today's video. Hope you've enjoyed it. I know I rambled, rambled a lot. Maybe I repeated myself a little bit, but hopefully I got my points across. I love doing this format because it's a little bit different than a live stream. I, I'm not worried, you know, that I'm not reading all the chat or anything like that. Um, you know, the live stream, I like to interact and that's the whole point and you know just the fun of the live stream is interacting with the chat the whole time and so I don't get to uh, you know say my opinions maybe as well or as uh, well thought out as I have here and so I hope you've enjoyed this format leave me a comment we can have a little bit more of a uh, you know maybe more of a thoughtful discussion and uh, I will try and read as many of them as I can I believe we got like almost 300 comments on the last video so I did respond to as many of, the, of those as I could don't don't uh, uh, be too hard on me if I don't get all of them, but I'll try and get as many comments as I can. I will definitely read all of them and respond to as many as I can. So, uh, And let me know what your topics uh, are for next week, what topics you would like to discuss, what, your, what are your requests, in other words. And again, leave a like if you enjoyed the video. I really appreciate that as well. And should I keep doing this? Let me know. You know, we can we can start doing other things. Really, if you guys watch the video, leave those likes and let me know that you like it. Then I'll keep doing it. And if not, we can uh, maybe do a couple more and then uh, move on. So just let me know. So with that being said, again, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so, and hit that notification bell to be notified every time we go live or have a new video. Of course, tomorrow will be live, and we will announce that location uh, tomorrow being Friday morning at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. We go live every Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, so don't miss those live streams. Uh, it's our favorite part of the week, and we just really love and enjoy sharing Disney with you guys. And of course, uh, you know, last night, actually, we did uh, Universal. Jenna was able to share that with you as well. So uh, we love sharing all the Central Florida parks with you. Also, be sure to check out our sponsors, MickeyBlog.com and MickeyTravels.com for the best and free Disney vacation planning advice. Let MickeyTravels.com plan your trip for you. Let them do all the hard work. It doesn't cost any more than a regular Disney vacation at MickeyTravels.com. Also, if you're thinking about moving to Central Florida, talk to Victor Naraki. His website is CelebratingFlorida.com. Or you can go follow him on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Naraki Realtor and tell him that Resort TV One sent you. So go talk to him and he will help you plan your move to the Walt Disney World area if that is something you're planning on doing. So that's all for now. We'll see you next time. So for now, have a great big beautiful tomorrow. Bye-bye. Now that you've finished watching this video, be sure that you're subscribed so that you can get all of the latest updates. Also, check out some other great videos on our channel. Have a great big beautiful tomorrow. Bye-bye.